Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Bear Leak Project, how the heck are you? I've got expert in Anunnaki, ancient Sumerian tablets, author, also frequent guest on Coast to Coast, Matthew LaCroix with us, The Illusion of Us. It's really nice to speak with you, Matthew. Now, we were talking for a few minutes before the show, kind of putting things together. He is going to share with us 28 different slides that link to today's discussion about this suppressed history. Now, we're going to talk about giant cuneiform writing, the code of Hammurabi. A lot of stuff that's connected, folks, and what's fascinating is these creation tablets that I've been recently discussing here on the Leak Project and how Marduk kind of took the throne, the destruction of Tiamat, also these tablets that talk about the Anunnaki that aren't even linked to any translations by Zachariah Sitchin, completely different, and they're very difficult to get a hold of. Well, Matthew is going to kind of put things together for us in a very fluid fashion, we're going to discuss how all these timelines connect. We're also going to discuss this library that was destroyed that had more information than the Library of Alexandria. And what was the name of that one? Um, the Library of Ashurbanipal. And, and when we actually talk about Ashurbanipal, you'll be like, that's, okay, that's who that is. It's, it's interesting. Connecting all these is difficult to do because it hasn't really been done extensively by a lot of different documentaries and, you know, channels and, and one thing I'd like to say also is I find it fascinating when I read through these tablets and these stories. I've read just about every story that's available via translated at Oxford University's website and the Sumerian tablets. I've read through uh, a pantheon of other, uh, I guess you could say, creation stories, the seven tablets of creation, the uh, Enuma, Elish, etc. And I'm finding that there's this underlying parallel of these battles in the heavens. Yeah. And whether or not they're, they're planets that are linking to other planets, I think there's a lot of astro theology. And I also feel that there's a lot of politics involved. So they like intermingle politics and astro theology and battles and wars and information. And, and it's just fascinating. So I can't wait to hear how you're going to put this together. You've been on the show uh, many times before. People always love your work. So do I. So Thanks. let's rock and roll. Thanks a lot. Great. It's, it's awesome to be here, Rex. I really appreciate having these really in-depth conversations with you. Um, so, I like to consider, you know, yourself and myself pretty well versed on a lot of these ancient sites. You know, we, you know, we're on the internet all the time where people, people are posting these on Facebook or you're on YouTube or you're reading books, ancient, ancient history books that are going over these sites. You know, you learn about Babylon, you know, everyone, everyone knows about Babylon and you learn about the Assyrian empire, but, but there's these other places that as I have kind of uncovered them somewhat recently within the last six months, it was strange to me that I had never heard of them before. That was the first thing that struck me. A place like Jerwan, with this giant cuneiform writing that's bigger than anywhere else in Mesopotamia, and, it's, and nobody really talks about it, and it's not even translated. It's these very strange things I started to come across. Um, and I, I'm with someone who's very well versed in the Enuma Elish and all of these different places, and as, and as I was connecting, Dirwan and, and Nineveh and Babylon, the whole thing started to kind of unfold. As, con connecting as in I wanted to put something together for Dirwan because I had never even seen someone talk about it. So I wasn't even planning on talking about Nineveh or Babylon originally at all, but it kind of just happened. It was like the story was unfolding. And I like to think that the truth, it really, it really wants, to, it wants to come out. It's like that that energy of truth just once, once you kind of come across it and you're studying and you're like, you really can feel it. And it was, it was like that story was unfolding and, I, and it really needs to be known. And, and this is the importance of why it needs to be known. Anyone who's read the Enuma Elish knows the importance and significance of what's in that. You know, the tablets one through five is this creationist story of what happened in our ancient solar system long ago. And then you get tablet like tablet six and seven that talk about you know, like the creation of mankind and the genetic altercation by the gods and all these very strange things. And yet, if we didn't have this library that we're going to talk about in Nineveh called the Library of Ashurbanipal, we would never even have these writings today at all. You know, so we're going to go over the chance of why we even have those and how the whole story is connected back to the Sumerians and, and the Anunnaki. And it's a really amazing sequence of events that occur in the timeline of our history. You know, and also you were showing me some of those images before the show, this, this giant cuneiform writing. And I imagine these, you know, very large people that, you know, they, they probably could be seven, eight, nine feet tall. I don't know. I mean, how big were they? Well, that's the question. 
if you have writing all over Mesopotamia and even other places like in Bolivia, there's some strange writing on like the Fuente Magna Bowl that's cuneiform, right? But the, the, the cuneiform writing everywhere that we find, no matter where it is in the world, mostly out of Mesopotamia, is all around the same size. Even in, in, in large temples, if you have cuneiform writing or wherever they are, they're, it's all about the same size. And yet, there's this one location, Jirwan, Iraq, you know, the center of all of this, where this writing of cuneiform writing is like 10 times bigger than any, anything else we've seen. And it's, it, of course, has to dawn on you, right, that if you've studied anything about the ancient kings and the Anunnaki and the Nephilim and all of these things, you know that there were very tall, like giants back then, basically, you could call them, right? There were, there were very tall beings. And the first thing that you would think of would be that's the size they would write, right? If, if, if they were going to write cuneiform writing, they wouldn't do tiny little that they have to try to stencil in, it would be, it would be larger cuneiform writing. I, and I believe that Jirwan, maybe the reason why no one's heard of it, is it maybe the only place in the world where the, this giant cuneiform writing survived today. I'm not saying it's the only giant, giant cuneiform writing, but I think most of it was probably destroyed, gotten rid of. How many questions would that bring up? The strange giant writing. So we're gonna go through the, that whole thing and to, to try to kind of understand and let me play devil's advocate for a minute and just also yep. bring up another possibility. I mean, isn't it very possible that it could have been just regular sized people writing larger on a structure so it would be like a warning sign or it would be like, okay, look at the status of these guys. Now, with that being said, I've seen plenty of ancient cuneiform tablets and um, cave paintings, etc. And there's plenty of information that I feel there were absolutely giants without a shadow of a doubt, giants that, that walked the earth. I mean, even a recent... Uh, report Farsight Institute, they were remote viewing these giants, but we're talking these giants that are like the size of buildings, like Godzilla status. So, pretty well, wild stuff. And not even, and I guess that's not even the direction. No. Show. Um, yeah, absolutely possible. And that's not even the direction I kind of wanted to go. I actually, um, when, I, when I saw this giant writing, of course, that's the first thing that dawned on me. But to me, it was, why have I never heard of it? And why, why is it not translated? Of course, Maybe it was done by, you know, by, by larger people. But there's a lot of strange things that came up. And so that's what I originally wanted to research was Jirwan. And as that unfolded, it led me to the Siege of Nineveh and the Ashurbanipal Library in Babylon with the Code of Hammurabi. And then connected all the way back to the Numa Elish and the Sumerian King List. And before I knew it, it was like this web of, of this story that had gone through the Assyrian Empire and kind of the rise and fall and what occurred. So let's, let's begin, Rex. Let's go into some of these um, really, really great, great slides. I want to kind of tie this to the time we're in right now. We're in this, we're in this very unstable world where the, the Middle East is the great, kind of the great conflict of our, you know, our, our lifetimes, where places like Iraq and Syria have been targeted by what we perceive as this kind of internal civil war threat with terrorists that are kind of blossoming and then going to attack other places. But there's this whole underlying other side to it that a lot of people in, in our mainstream are talking about it, but not in regular society. And, and, and the idea is, why is there so much conflict in this area? And why has, have so many of these monuments and artifacts been destroyed by a terrorist group that it seems to be way too well-funded and, and has this like organization to it that it's, that's beyond anything we've seen, like they're almost this remnant of like the Roman armies where they would go through and just destroy and burn everything, right? It was, it's like, it's exactly the same mentality as that. But it's a very strange thing if you were a terrorist group to do that. Um, and so that's why you, people started to look at the idea that when things like, um, when we invaded Iraq and we had the Iraqi museum raided and all the artifacts were stolen by soldiers and uh, bandits and mercenaries and all these things, it was very convenient that all that stuff disappeared, some would say, right? Because they would, it kind of conflicts with a lot of the things that we're told. And that's where we're, we're gonna go right now. We're gonna, we're gonna go into those conflicting, the conflicting information, but give really good evidence to back it up so we can understand what really is the, the truth of our history, not just some fantastical imagination that someone may think someone's coming up with just because, you know, it sounds good to them. But let's, we're gonna follow the evidence. And we're going to follow a, a timeline 
because we got to understand this before it's gone. I'm going to show a picture at the very end. This is the gates of Nineveh, and it's no longer there anymore. Really important areas that tie into some of the most important writings that describe what really happened in the past, and who the gods were and who we really are too, came from these sites. So, and then now they're all being destroyed. So I, and, and most of them are, um, haven't even been fully uncovered yet. That's the other really interesting aspect. So let's go through kind of a chronological order. And I want to start with, I want to start with a time period of around 700 to 1000 BC. We're going to, we're going to begin in the Assyrian Empire. And, um, and, and this is, of course, one of the most famous empires in, in all of history. Uh, it's important to, to kind of wrap your mind around this to get both maps and to kind of visualize it. So, so let's do that. Try to imagine yourself, you know, back at 1000 BC. And we're going to go to the, to, to the site of Jerwan. As you can see, it's right below the mountains, okay? The Zagros Mountains kind of connecting all the way up into the Himalayas. And, and in, just south of it is where all these, these rivers essentially flow down into. And that's where ancient society began, right? Right along, you know, ancient uh, Eridu with the Sumerians right down along the Persian Gulf. And, and so we're going to follow that north and kind of piece together why so many so much of this is important right i talk to a lot of people with this and they're like oh you're just going to go through a history lesson of bore me but when you actually understand these things and what happened and how it connects back to the gods it's it's absolutely amazing it really is it's, it's an incredible story and and most people know uh the city of mosul which is right in the center where all the fighting is but but that's also mosul is where these ancient cities of nineveh and jerwan was so Jirwan was um, is found just south of the, of the Zagros Mountains, and it was kind of the lifeblood of this ancient city of Nineveh. And the story kind of begins with with Jirwan, Nineveh, and Sennacherib. And Sennacherib was this ancient king of of Nineveh, and the whole Assyrian Empire kind of revolved around his dominance of the, of the region. And he had these incredible aqueducts that Jirwan created and they were believed to be the first on earth and he had Nineveh built and there was all these incredible structures built about him and at the same time you look at his description and what he looks like and we're going to go through uh, Rex and I were talking about before looking at Asher Bonapal you know these incredibly tall men with these sometimes tall on these skulls and and how they had direct lineage connections to the Sumerians and it becomes very interesting to know what really actually happened here so Sennacherib was the first king because that we're going to discuss because he's the one who kind of set the stage. He be, he made the Assyrian Empire to what it kind of started as as, as a great empire with Nineveh blossom. Now I want to point out some of the dates that, that we have. I'm, I'm going to give during this. They may not be exactly right because a lot of the the dates that we've been given for timelines is is off. If you take like a place like Gobekli Tepe, and we've radiocarbon dated that to like 11,000 years old, and yet that throws off the entire timetable of what we're given for you know nomadic tribes and societies developing slowly so the whole timetable has to be potentially shifted slightly but we're going to kind of do the best we can and leave some wiggle room in there and th and this is what jerwan actually looked like um and of course thousands of years ago when it was actually cre there um it was much much larger it's we've gone through significant erosion and, and, and maybe even disasters that have, that have washed away and, you know, taken away much of what this great aqueduct was. But to understand the kind of how amazing it is, it's the, it was the first aqueduct on Earth, right? Just happens to have this giant cuneiform writing on it and then connect back to Nineveh. But it was, it was the kind of lifeblood of the city of Nineveh. And it brought all the water to the city itself. And today you look at Mosul and where it's kind of the center where a lot of this, these battles have been, and you find out it's basically the exact same place of where Nineveh was, the ancient city of Nineveh. And that should be really interesting to a lot of people if you consider the fact that you can't even go to a place like that right now. It's, it's you can't even get in. It, it's so dangerous that it's, it's completely overrun still by, you know, kind of temporary governments and various things like that. And it was, it was amazing to find out that, it, that the, the famous hanging gardens of Babylon, it's always been talked about, was, it was actually a, mis, a mistake and kind of a misunderstanding and that the, the hanging gardens were actually in Nineveh. And that's why Jerwan 
was this incredible aqueduct that fed into it. And that's how it was able to support these hanging gardens because Babylon didn't have any kind of aqueduct system like that, not anywhere near as advanced. So you can already understand this city of Nineveh in kind of, at the time was, it was a city beyond anything on earth. And, and that's where the kind of the entire Syrian empire story and the, and the libraries that they gathered begins because because when Sennacherib died and, and moved on, we started to see more and more instability to the south. And one of the neat things about the Assyrians is they have a vast library of, and, um, of basically showing us examples of their mightiness as an empire. Extensive different things that were found um, when they excavated parts of the city. And they show massive armies with advanced, you know, uh, weapons and horses and it was the Assyrian Empire dominated the entire the largest area of the world at that time and it and it was they showed these conquests and all of these different murals and descriptions and it was it's amazing to learn and go back and kind of run through each of these battles and what they occurred and we're, we're of course can't go through all of them because there's too many but we're going to focus on the siege of Nineveh and why that happened and what what that led to so Nineveh. Um, what an amazing place to research and uncover and, and learn about. This is just an artist's description of it based on what they, people said when they were there. But Nineveh, found where Mosul is today, was considered by scholars and people that had actually visited to be like the most beautiful city in the entire world. And it was, besides these really, really colorful, enormous buildings and temples, of course, they had the hanging gardens all over the place, which meant there would be flowers and and vines and things growing all over the walls everywhere where you'd be walking. And it was, you know, grapes and everything. And it was, it was an incredible place. And, and of course, jealousy started to arise further to the south from, from Babylon. And that's where, that's where the tension started to begin because you have these two cities that, that both want to dominate this empire. And you have this, the tension between the two of them because, because both of these cities had ancient bloodline kings that have been ruling them both. So, and I want to go through some of those to, to see where they, where they fit in. But basically, Babylon, you can see, was found 300 miles to the south of Nineveh. So far enough that they weren't at least on their doorstep, but, but close enough where they, they could be constantly fighting and having battles. And that happened constantly. They had skirmishes and they had small civil wars that would break out, but Nineveh would always triumph because it was, it was the capital city of of the entire empire at the time. When you start researching Babylon and you learn about who, who was kind of in control of Babylon, it's really interesting to learn that um, the god there who was kind of in charge of Babylon was known as Shamash. And this is what I, I wanna really lay out to have people understand is that people have the Sumerians in their mind of where they belong and then they have the Babylonians, and then they have the Assyrians, and then they move to places like the Hittites, and then they move into the Romans and places like that. But we have to understand it all came from the same place. They're all just, they're all, they all descendants of these Sumerian kings. And that's why when we, when you, we connect and learn about Babylon and who these gods of Babylon were, you see that it always connects back to Sumer. So learning about Babylon, you learn that, um, the god there was, was known as Shamash. And, and you, if you just do a little search on Shamash, you find out that in, in Sumer, his name was Utu. It's like, and, and every time, that's what's amazing about, about when you learn about these ancient history aspects is that, is that all of these gods are always connected back to the Sumerians, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, you know, the Akkadian gods. These, these, they're always connected back to the Sumerians. They just have different names. And they always have the, the same traits, though. And, that, and that's how I really want to try to... So many people still think so much of it is a myth. The gods are a myth. And all of those things are just a myth. But they're all, they're all based on something real. And, and us thinking they're a myth, the longer that goes on, on the, it'll be the longer we kind of stay in ignorance. Right, Rex? Sure, sure. And let me jump in on that. Because you're bringing up some, some really good topics. And I'm looking at the live chat right now. We've got a pretty good-sized audience and it's just growing and growing and growing. A lot of times you come on the show, the podcast will get 50,000 views in just a week, sometimes even less. This, this information, when you brought up the gods, I am starting to really, 
after reading all these tablets and stories and reading through ancient uh, you know, history, whether it be a translation of a, a treasure trove of hidden cuneiform tablets that were discovered, whether it is a, you know, a Gnostic text, whether it's uh, um, something out of the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, whether it's something out of morals and dogma or some type of ancient Masonic type information, Rosicrucian type information. I've noticed that there's these under hermetics. I just read the seven principles of the hermetics that are linked to the Kabbalion. And, and it seems like there's this underlying theme of the gods and, and what are the gods and the gods need us as much as we need them. And are they planetary objects that can then manifest themselves into forms like we would see as a human or a superhuman because when I, when I read through these creation stories, these tablets, I am, I'm imagining literally, I'm visualizing these, these wars in heaven that are either from just planetary bodies coming in because they get linked to the gravity of another planet or the sun or something like that. And it talks about Marduk kind of taking control. Because if you read through those tablets, right, it starts off that uh, Marduk isn't the creator. And then at the end, Marduk created everything and has all the power and, so, and stuff like that. And, and, and Marduk's linked to the sun. And then you've heard these stories about Venus being captured into the solar system and, and how it caused mass chaos. And, and then you get into the electronic universe, the electric universe theory. And then I'm starting to wonder when they describe these battles and these beings, are there wars going on in heaven? And then somehow it manifests here in the physical plane on this earth as well, like as above, so below, once again, linking these, these hermetic principles. I mean, what are the gods, man? I mean, are they, are they like He-Man? Are they like uh, Superman? Are they like Wonder Woman? Hello. Well, actually, they are. <laughs> yeah. If you think about it, and Nana. Hello. That's those are great points, Rex. And who are the gods? And what are these? What is heaven? And what are these battles? It all just comes down to dimensions. That's all. It, it's all it simply is. And they are simply advanced beings that are in higher dimensions than us. And so we can't perceive higher dimensions because we're in. We're in largely in the third dimension still. And that's why. But because the third dimension is what decides so much of reality it's 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 the stage and the next the, i have the writing i'm doing for my next book is called the stage of time because it focuses on what why the third dimension is so important and how it is it's the battlefield of of all you know of mortal life and of of physical matter that's what the third dimension is but that physical fighting is what determines both of the, 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 what happens in the above dimensions and what happens below. So, but not to get out too far off track, Rex, you pointed out, you know, what are these gods? Are they planets? Are they, what are they? Well, this image I have right here, we're talking about Babylon. Well, the God, the God of Babylon was Shamash. This is Shamash. And we're, we also talked about how, well, were there giant beings back then? Were, the, were these Anunnaki really real? Were they really that tall? Well, it shows a very interesting example of, of some of the workers that were there. And if some, I know there are those people are out there are going to say, well, if you research some of these ancient cultures that you find out they actually use dwarfs at times and various things, so those could be dwarf people, but they really don't look like dwarf people if you look at the, the proportions of them. And not to mention the, the descriptions of these gods and how they were tall. So this is Shamash, right? And he is supposed to be the solar sun of, he's the sun of Marduk. So you, you just automatically connect right back to Sumer. It, doesn't, it takes one small little connection to realize, to figure out that Shamash, to learn who Shamash is and how he's Utu, and then you learn he's the son of Marduk. So we're going we're gonna to go into why that's, that's important, because of, because of this rivalry between Nineveh and, and Babylon, okay? Um, one of the one of the inter really interesting things about Nineveh is is some of the gods that were represented there. We're going to go over that in a second. So let's 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 go through Babylon for a minute. Now Babylon at the same time as Nineveh was actually larger than Nineveh was, but it was a little more like an urban sprawl. And but it had over two hundred thousand people at the time. I imagine much larger than either they were actually even giving it credit for. I wouldn't be surprised if it had almost half a million people. So you have this massive city of of Babylon, right on, built along the banks of the Euphrates River. And that's, and, and that's another thing to think about is that Babylon is on the Euphrates River, right? And Nineveh is on the Tigris River. And so you have these two mighty rivers that donned these massive empires and civilizations, but because they were part of the same empire, they started fighting. And that's, 
why so much was so much becomes lost and and that story of babylon and how it connects back to to what we're about to go over is is how, with um king hammurabi now this is hammurabi right here being given kind of kingship and, and information by shamash so if you remember we just talked about how it, it, it's a very simple even like a wikipedia search just look up and look up you know the king her hammurabi who's a well-known king and you find out he was become he became king because shamash gave him basically rulership and he was the solar deity god of babylon so it, you start to blur the lines you're like wait a minute though i thought that was all just a that wasn't real you start to see that it is very real because look that's shamash on the right and he's talking to hammurabi and we're going to go over what he said to him and and, and, and we're going to read a little bit of excerpt from what's called the Code of Hammurabi. So King Hammurabi came into power and he kind of took over Babylon. And, and he believed that he was the divine and rightful king of Mesopotamia because he, he, he claims uh, that he received this, this, these direct instructions from Shamash, who gave him these moral laws to follow in the form of visions and various things like that. And he had it written down in this massive cuneiform tablet, one of the largest in the world. And it's called the Code of Hammurabi. And it's, um, what's on it is very interesting because it talks about gods that, that were in Sumer, right? It's like these are, these, here they are, we have the Babylonians and Assyrians directly talking about the Sumerian gods. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, just the beginning where it starts. And this, this Code of Hammurabi um, is it's seven and a half feet tall, just if you want to try to picture in your mind of how large it is. And it has these, this long list of, of moral, um, moral laws to follow, actually 282 that go through, you know, ways to create a better world type of thing. And this is how it, this is how it starts, that, that basically Hammurabi says. And, and, Hammurabi, and he states in the very beginning, Anu and Bel called by name me, Hammurabi, the exalted prince who feared God to bring about the rule of righteousness to the land, to destroy the wicked, and the evildoers, so that the strong should not harm the weak, so that I should rule over the people like Shamash, and enlighten the land to further the well-being of mankind. So it's, it's really, he directly mentions Anu right there, and, and Bel, so, and Shamash. So really quickly, let's break this down. Shamash is, a, is the god of Babylon. You find out he's a son of Marduk, right? Who in Shamash's name in Sumerian is Utu, and his father was Marduk, who we, everyone knows very well because he's one of the most powerful gods in Sumer. And at the same time, he also mentions Anu and Bel. Well, Bel is Marduk. That's simply just another, that was the Babylonian name for Marduk. So there's, there's the connection back to that. And at the same time, he mentions Anu, who, of course, is what the name Anunnaki comes from. He's the, he's the head chief of the of the gods supposedly right of these of these beings so he's basically saying that anu and marduk with rules given from shamash made him ruler of babylon that's essentially what that breaks down to and i i find that really amazing because i don't think a lot of people really know that or or connect kind of how that how that fits in let's go to the next aspect of this because several thousand years ago in Babylon, basically went, it took over by the, it became taken over by the Hittites of Turkey and it became kind of absorbed into that empire. And the Assyrian empire would, would morph into the Hittite empire eventually. And that, and the interesting about that is the Hittites would eventually become what we know of as the Romans. That area would, of Turkey would eventually become kind of the Roman empire. So it's always, it's always connected back to some original place. So the Hittites took over and Babylon kind of became part of that empire and they, and they had their sights set on conquering Nineveh because of all the things that were present there. And at the same time that Babylon was rising to the south, getting influence from the Hittites, we had this new king take over, um, take over Nineveh named, Nineveh named Ashurbanipal. Now this image, Rex wanted to talk about this based on the description of the, of the elongated head, but and they may not know that this is King Ashurbanipal. And who cares, right? Until you learn about what he did. And, and to me, the efforts that Ashurbanipal did are some of the most uh, important in history. From 668 to approximately 627 BC-ish, 
he transformed Nineveh to the most powerful it was at the time. And after he did that, he, he became obsessed with high uh, intellectual knowledge, basically. He wanted to learn as much as he could about what the ancients knew and not just, you know, conquer all the other places around him and to continue to build his empire. And he decided to focus on a completely other aspect, which was very interesting at the time. And he was actually, and it was considered an intellectual high priest as well, which is another reason maybe why he had interest in this area. So, but what he did was when they were kind of, the Syrian empire was at its strongest and Nineveh was at the strongest, he put together an, an army of, of um, scholars and explorers and those who just, who could um, help him out in, in this area. And he traveled and sent off people in every direction to down towards Egypt and down all the way down towards Eridu, the original part of Eridu in southern Iraq and, and over up towards um, Iran and all those areas. And he basically where, go to every single ancient place that you could possibly go to and find all these ancient cuneiform writings and bring them back. That's what he tasked them to do. He wanted to create the largest library on earth. And that's what gets back to the fact that we've all, most of us have heard of the Library of Alexandria, which is all written on paper and wooden documents and things like that. Whereas this library was almost completely composed of cuneiform writings. And, and it was a completely different aspect because they were finding basically the oldest writings on earth. And he wanted to, to put, bring them together. Did he know that they were being destroyed and, and, and hunted down? I, I think he did. I think perhaps, I think perhaps Asher Bonapal was um, tasked with gathering these or, or wanted to at least gather them because he knew that they were being targeted. He gathers all of these, uh, all these writings together. And shortly after he gathered them, he, he died, right? In 612 BC, he died. And right after he died, like the entire empire just literally started to crumble and fall apart. It was like this, this man, this intellectual uh, leader was holding together the entire Assyrian empire. And right after he died, and as you've seen in so many other things, the whole empire started to collapse and Babylon basically started marching north with uh, the Chaldea and Medes people to immediately dis uh, attack Nineveh and kind of take over and then make Babylon the center of the, of the entire empire. And when I was researching this and I was looking into it, I found it very interesting that that they chose that moment to go attack them, you know, seize the, the weakest moment, but also right after he had amassed that entire library. And we're going we're gonna to go into that, uh, what happened with that as well. So in, right after he died, after 612 BC, we had, we had this war breaking out and this library, this, this is what Asher Bonapal's library looked like or what it looked like after. This, this giant underground area of, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of cuneiform writings from all over Mesopotamia with, with the most ancient stories we have. And this army at the same time is marching north to come destroy the entire city. And so we have so many different murals and descriptions of these battles that occurred with, these, with the Assyrian Empire. And we have depictions of what the Siege of Nineveh was like, but it was basically... It, it took more than a year to even, to even capture the city. Um, we don't even have records of how many people actually died. But, we, but what we do know is that as the Babylonians were riding north, they realized that they could not capture the city if they just tried to march in. It was one of the, it was one of the largest cities on earth at the time. It was an advanced city. They had some of the best military that, that the world has ever seen. So they got really smart. They realized that if they flooded the city, they could simply just f f ride in on boats and just take over the entire thing. Because remember, both of them were built on rivers. That, and, and Nineveh, in that case, was built on the Tigris River. So they rode north, and that's what they did. They simply dammed the river up, and they flooded the entire city. But I'm looking at this image, and I'm seeing like this background with immense detail. And it looks like people have been you know, impaled like Vlad the Impaler did. If you look at the background of this, you've got these people looking out on these towers. You've got these people that are walking up to fight those on the towers. But then you've got these like giants and the, these dudes look huge in comparison. And wow, I just find it fascinating. I have not seen this tablet before. 
And how old do you think this thing is? So this is not actually the siege of Nineveh, but it's, it's another, it's another um, siege of the Assyrian Empire. And, they, and it's, well, it's thousands of years old. We don't have an exact date because I do believe that a lot of the things are older than we've been given. But it basically is depicting the, um, the massive battles that they had and what, and what transpired in them. And, and as you said, I'd never seen this before either. When I, I, had, go, I had to go through and actually research and really find all this stuff to, to see the kind of the monumental struggles that occurred and also what we're about to go into with, with the library. They took over Nineveh and they captured and they killed everybody and they basically burned down the entire library, okay? Well... Thankfully, cuneiform writing, if anybody knows, um, can withstand fire. And, and it's places like the Library of Alexandria disappeared and we're never going to see them ever again. And Plato talks about how it had information about Atlantis and all kinds of things like that. And we're never going to know. Well, these writings, think, because they were cuneiform, they can, they can withstand a lot more. So they survived. And, and so in 1849... There was a British research team led by Austin Henry Laird that was exploring the area and they found this Royal Library of Ashurbanipal. And they brought back the 30,000 cuneiform tablets. Think about that, Rex. Think about all the cuneiform tablets we have today, you know, up at the University of Oxford and all these different places. And th this, this library alone would amass almost our entire collection. But here's the thing that's, that's really strange that's where you start getting to the conspiracy side of this. Of those 30,000 cuneiform writings that they brought to be housed, most of them are not even organized in, at all. They're not even put in an arrangement in order or translated. So you have all these writings that are our oldest writings on earth that tell us basically the truth of what happened. And most of them are just sitting gathering dust. They're just sitting there with people walking in like this and just like staring at them. And... And that's, and that's their whole future, for now at least. And nobody even bothers to file complaints that all of these t tablets have not been, you know, translated extensively and looked at it so we could figure out what they actually say. Instead, they just sit there. And, and I want to add. Yeah, you're right. right. And I want to add to that even. If you go back 100 years, you go back in like the late 1800s, there was a lot more discussion, it seemed, in at least the universities that you can actually get access to books now where they've done translations. And like you brought up earlier about the Anunnaki, there's not a whole lot of tablets that you can actually translate directly to the Anunnaki that people have access to. Well, you go back to this book from the 1800s with a, uh, that has a, you know, just a, a bounty of ancient Mesopotamian texts that were translated. It's also got the, uh, the cuneiform clay tablets, the seven tablets of creation, etc. And the Anunnaki are clearly described and clearly translated in this from 1880. So people cared about it more back then than they do now. Now it's exactly. like- Exactly. That's okay, a great, that's a great point, Rex. Thank you for bringing that up. Let's if go watch some, my 650 pound life now. Yeah. <laughs> if, if some people are wondering why I'm talking about this whole thing with, the li with Nineveh and the and Ashurbanipal library, is we have to understand that if Ashurbanipal did not amass these writings like the Enuma Elish. I'm going to go over some of the, I'm going to go over some of the tablets that are in just some of them that are in this live royal library that were found. The Enuma Elish is one of them, which is to me the, the most important tablet set of tablets we have. And not in Epic of Gilgamesh is one of them. And then most of them are not even named or they just have numbers and they don't, they have nothing more than that. And the point of that is, like you said, the Enuma Elish is one of the only ones in here that's been translated. And things like the Epic of Gilgamesh are considered like a poem or just some like some story. That's, that's, all, that's all it's talked about. Even though you can find out who Gilgamesh was and you can find out all these different names for so many of them. And I want to specifically talk about the Enuma Elish again because that was part of the Ashurbanipal Paul Library and the significance of what was in it. And Rex, you talked about how the first five tablets is is like basically the only thing we have that describes possibly right what happened to our solar system so much further so long ago that we obviously have no other records that even really talk about it and here we have five tablets that discuss exactly what happened with these sumerian gods like marduk 
basically taking over planets and various moons and various things with their names, right? And then acting out this great play. But, but that's not the most important thing about this because I do think that's extremely important. But I think tablet number six is the most important of all. Because, and, and I wanna also point out that if you go look up for translations of tablet number six of the Enuma Elish, you'll find many of them with slightly different translations, but largely the same. But if you go to official places like the University of California and these other places, I found it appalling to find out, to see something like the first five tablets in there translated and then they just like ignore the sixth one. Just like happily ignore it and it has nothing even there. And then, and then the seventh one maybe has like a little blurb about it. The most important tablet of all is, is not even translated in a lot of places. And that to me is a very telling thing. So what is on tablet six that's so important that it needs to be in, in what I consider like things like the siege of Nineveh in this library, I think it was an attempt to try to destroy so many of these. How many of these tablets were destroyed? I mean, many of them could have been destroyed with um, broken and, and we never found so much of it. I mean, what we have of 30,000 tablets could be like a fraction of what actually really existed. And, we're, and we only have like the scraps there left over. And so this on, I want to read an excerpt from Tablet 6 um, because it's really important. And, and, and this is basically, this is what it says. They bound him, holding him before Ea. And Ea was known as Enki. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood, he, Ea, created mankind, on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. After the wise Ea, had created mankind and had imposed the service of the gods upon them. The task is beyond comprehension. The gods were then divided, all of the Anunnaki into upper and lower groups. He assigned 300 in the heavens to guard the decrees of Anu and appointed them as guard. And of course, Rex mentioned about Marduk, who became the one who was in charge of, of deciding which gods went where. And he, he became in control of basically the realm of reality. And that's why we talk about this sacrifice and worship of Bell and it's all refer referencing this blood sacrifice stuff, always coming back to Marduk in my opinion. So all these seven tablets, number six is the most important of all of them. And this is what they look like. There's these fragmented pieces of rock with these cuneiform writing on it, but, but yet they hold some of the most important information of all time that came from these libraries. I, and, and this is where we kind of connect this is to understand that the Assyrian Empire is simply just a later empire of what started as the Sumerians. And you always have to go back to the source if you want to try and find the truth of, of these stories and where, where it all began. And yet, it's amazing that the Sumerians are ba barely even spoken about in school. They give, they give them almost no information about why they had such sophistication and how they developed mathematics and writing and agriculture and how they wrote about how all those all those things were handed down to them from heaven and all these things. And yet we just kind of bat an eye most times and just let it be that they developed all that themselves. And I think one of our, the greatest things that limits us in, in terms of mankind and discovering this is that we have enormous egos and we're so proud of all of our, our developments. So the idea that things were given to us and that we didn't develop them, like everything from the Sumerians all the way to the Mayans, really angers people because then they they think oh we you know we didn't we didn't develop them ourselves with our own ingenuity i just i kind of find it funny that that we always just go to that road instead of considering the idea that it was given to us well it's interesting also when you read through for example the sumerian tablets and the uh sumerian king list it describes how the kingship descended from heaven and it describes the first king and I am wondering if the first king is actually Adam that's described in Genesis from the Old Testament. There's been so many different stories that have been adopted and, and taken from the Sumerian culture and put in, uh, you know, it's put in modern religion scriptures. Yeah, it's right out in the open, right, right there, right? We think it's all a joke. And yet Adam is, and we're going to go over, it mentions Adam in, in many places. I want to talk about the Sumerian king list. I mean, this, these things are right in front of us. And yet, most still think it's, it's, it's a fairy tale. We tied in Nineveh. We tied in Babylon. 
the Sumerians. We're going to go back and where we started in Jerwan. Because this is how you enter Jerwan if you were to walk to Jerwan into the site of this aqueduct. We talked about we talked about how there's this giant writing there. We'll look at these giant murals. This is hundreds of feet high, this cliff. It's huge. And these and these statues are so big that some people just to see how big they are have to like look at them with binoculars to try to get the scope of how enormous it is. Um, and this is called Kinnis Rock and, and at the site of Jerwan where this just happens to be the first aqueduct on earth, right? For the city of Nineveh. And, and on the left side, we have, um, we have Sennacherib, the, who was basically credited with being that kind of the first king who designed these aqueducts and aqueducts in Nineveh and all these things. And here he is with the, these Sumerian gods, just like he, just like the Babylonian Hammurabi king mentions how he was given kingship by Shamash and Marduk. It's the same thing. Here you have Sennacherib saying he was given, he was basically given kingship from Anu, the same thing. And Ashur, it's, it's the same. It's, it's amazing how the, the linkage when you start to look into it. And when you look into these Syrians and where they began, you find out that the first place was Ashur. And where does Ashur Banapal come from? But the name Ashur. And this is the god Ashur. And if you look up who Ashur was to the Sumerians, you will find that he was Enlil. So then quickly you, you, you connect back to, oh yeah, so Enlil, just like it says in so many of these writings, then established these empires up through the Mesopotamian Valley, up through, up through the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And it's, so it, it goes all the way back to literally the names of kings. So Ashur Banapal named himself that because he was, you know, this ancient connection back to Ashur, who is simply just Enlil. And that's what's kind of so neat about how the whole thing connects back, because it always does. And that's kind of how you know you're on the right track, when things, all, when, when things fit into place like that. So this is a Sumerian king list. And again, people hear about these long reigns. You mentioned Adam and these, these kings who reigned for more than hundreds of years some thousands of years and people try to wrap their heads around that and it and it it, it boggles their mind or they just can't some of them over 40,000 years matt that's 43,400 right. years i think was the top which was uh dumasid is that correct yeah yeah with with you know like more reigns than we even think some civilizations on earth were even around for i mean here's here's what's so interesting to to connect with this you hear a name like Enlil from the Sumerians. You say, what, what does that mean? Well, E-N simply means Can I, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Matt, I apologize. I'm not trying to, I just want to correct myself here because Dumazid, pre-flood, the shepherd, 36,000 years, the 43,200 year reign was from Enmenluana. And then so Alulam was the first king on the Sumerian king list, ruling for 28,800 years. Alulam might actually be, there's a very good chance with the research that's been done by many scholars is Adam. And if you go down this yeah. list, and if you read the, the Hebrew text of Genesis, they, they, they're linking up to also Ubaratulu. It's fascinating. So I, I'm not trying to knock you off guard there. I just wanted to make sure that- No, that's I awesome. Yeah. That. That's a lot. That's a long time, man. And that's what this says right here. This is the Sumerian king list. It's one, again, one of the oldest- cuneiform writings we have and we again think it's a myth we just ignore what it says right on it and what this is how it opens up the sumerian king list opens by saying kingship was lowered from heaven and then it looks it lists out the extensive reigns of all these different kings and stuff and rex doesn't that quote sound pretty familiar like the genesis genesis quote where it says kingship was lowered from heaven as well and the Gnostic texts, the Egyptians, you know, uh, you read through the, the pantheons and their uh, information and their gods. It's, yeah, it came from the heavens, came from, now you can, now here's one thing that I want to talk about for a second. When it yeah. discusses the heavens, you know, people are like, well, it's a different dimension. Is it, or is it a different part of the solar system? Is it a different part of the universe? Is it all of the above? It, it seems, I mean, yeah, that's a great question. And it seems from everything I've seen is heaven is simply anything beyond earth and hell or the lower dimensions was basically like underworld, inner earth and lower dimensions. And so we try to put a label on things and try to box and frame things so we can understand. But really we haven't really reached the point where we can fully understand yet. 
I think you, that was a good way to put it. I appreciated that. And also, though, I feel sometimes when hell is referred in ancient texts or when, when they say Hades, they're not referring to actually hell. They're referring to a, a certain part of the universe, the Hades constellations and the, the Hades section of the actual universe, not Hades, hell, inner earth. There's a lot of different um, symbology used with different things that we, we tend to take too literal. And yes, it can be... It can be a, very difficult to understand if we kind of don't know where to frame it from. Now, let's, we're going to come all the way back to where we started, because this is the most important thing of, of everything we've talked about in terms of the strangeness and the unusualness of the, this information. This is the best picture I can find of Jerwan. And if you try to find pictures of Jerwan, you'll find a lot of them, but you won't find a lot of comparisons of how big the writing is. It's very difficult, actually. Um, and... Jerwan, of course, was the first aqueduct on Earth that gave brought all the water to Nineveh and created the, those fa famous hanging gardens and that great lavish city that, that existed there. But, but we had to come back to the source because here, of all the places like you talked about, is this giant cuneiform writing on these huge limestone blocks. And if you look at the writing, if, we, if someone w had the time, it'd be really nice if it was a government operation or like a, some kind of a situation that was well funded that we could trust had the time we could actually find out what this says i have not been able to find any translations of any of this cuneiform writing and i know that you can do it yourself on U university of oxford so let's get this uncovered because this is what's so unusual about it this is the size of the cuneiform writing that's found in comparison to a man's hand almost all over mesopotamia and anywhere we can find this is the size of what it was written for we can imagine a regular person, right? A uh, consort or whatever it was. Yet at the same time, here we have this photograph. Now, when I was, re I, I, gotta, I gotta mention this because when I was researching Jerwan, I was searching, 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 searching for this exact example. I was like, I need to find an example of a hand or someone standing next to this writing so that I can show how big it is. And I searched for hours until I found some discreet, this, this photograph right here. And, I, and then I, of course, put it on some stuff and then a couple of people shared it on Pinterest. And when I went to go find the photograph again for this show to try to find a better one maybe, that original one didn't exist any longer. I could not find it. And the only one I could find was one, the one I had then put up, which was further degraded. So here, it, it's, it's preserved here in a slightly grainy form, but that is a man's hand that is sitting next to this cuneiform run. You can see his shadow very well there. It can't be made up. But look how enormous it is. This cuneiform writing, and it's, again, it's untranslated. And like I said, I had never even heard of it. I had never even heard of Jerwan in some, in some examples. It's, it's to me, and I started to put together the importance of these sites, and, I, and it started to make sense to me that the easiest way to simply the easiest way to hide something would be just to not talk about it or to destroy it. And that's where we're going to kind of come to the end of this with. There's, this is what the gates of Nineveh, remember the city directly connected to Jerwan and where the Ashurbanipal library was with the Enuma Elish and the Epic of Gilgamesh and all of those. This is what the site looks like now. And they, they've only partially uncovered it before they destroyed it. But this is what ISIS did to that site. You, completely, there's, you can still see the bulldozer. They actually destroyed literally everything. Who knows how long it's going to be before people can even get in and uncover it or what's left to even find. And so, Rex, I really appreciate everyone, you know, supporting a lot of the research and, you know, writers like me and uh, writers like Gerald Clark and a lot of these other researchers who we put ourselves out there and we, people, a lot of people, you know, say a lot of nasty things to us. But you know what? To me, the truth is all that matters. And if you in following evidence and along the trail regardless of what the predetermined um, viewpoint is of the rest of society or a lot of people, we got to follow the truth no matter what, because the truth is one of the most important things that matters. So check out, please check out my, um, I, I have a YouTube channel at Matthew LaCroix. I have a book of illusion of us. Um, and I really appreciate all the support with trying to uncover these because honestly, we don't, we don't have time to, uh, to continue to allow these to be destroyed. Um, Palmyra in Syria is another example was just destroyed as well. And there's been many, many other sites. So all of these ancient sites that connect back to the Assyrian Empire and then the Anunnaki and then and the Sumerians, 
they're just being wiped out and destroyed. Just kind of like the Roman Empire did with the, um, the Library of Alexandria. You know, and it's, it's neat. Gerald Clark's a really nice guy. He used to come on the show quite a bit, and hopefully I'll have an opportunity to speak with him again. So I've, you know, he's got some great books, great information, great researcher. Now, you know, another thing, Matthew, that I want to talk to you about before we close out tonight, after reading through all these tablets and stories and connecting the dots, what do you think and feel the, the next level is as far as um, disclosure? Well, right now we're seeing this soft disclosure of UFOs and advanced technology right now all over, you know, the news and stuff. And that's where the focus seems to be. But I do think the, the time frame that we're going to go for will be, there will be, like we're seeing in Egypt, there will be a major discovery made there, like below the pyramids or in, in one of these places. Something is going to come out and it will just kind of blow this whole thing open. And I think that the, we're seeing soft disclosure and of course soft disclosure in a lot of other ways too for ancient history, but we're seeing, we're seeing kind of momentum towards the truth, I think in a lot of areas. And it's, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see how fast the ancient history side comes out in terms of, cause it cause because of how fast the UFO advanced technology side is coming out with like Tom DeLonge and all that stuff that they're doing. So for me, I'm kind of, I'm looking at both sides and I'm waiting to, to that gap is bridged right because people have to say well who are the gods and and how that how does that connect to advanced civilizations and other beings in the universe and i'm waiting for that bridge to, that bridge to be to be connected hey thank you matthew man seriously it's a real honor to speak with you You're thanks very, for very being person. here thank you so much